Luke chapter 4, are we ready back there? We have a green light. We're, are we simulcasting at the same time? We are. Hey, everybody watching this all over the planet, I understand. China, what's up? Jimmy Lishman in South, uh, South Africa. Hey, everybody back there. Thank you for the wonderful email that you sent me. Um, we've got, I can't think of her name, I shouldn't mention her name, from Lebanon, from Qatar or Qatar. They're all over the planet, you guys, watching this little church. Wow. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Are you ready? Luke chapter 4. Would you join me there in verse number 31? We started last week, and I want to finish because I think it's important. Verse 31, Luke 4. And when he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths, and they were astonished at his teaching. Please understand, if it, maybe highlight that or certainly underscore it. You're going to see a powerful move of his supernatural power here in just a second. But notice his methodology. Teach first. God wants us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. There are many people that are panting after the supernatural experience but notice how Jesus does it. First comes teaching, doctrine. They were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? You might mark in your margin there. Revelation chapter 20. Um, they know that their end is coming. They don't know the future, only God does. Lucifer is a lot of things, as we'll see here this morning, but he is not omniscient and he does not know categorically the future. Only God does. That's why these demons are nervous. What are you doing here? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. One of the titles of Messiah. Verse 35. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. And they were all amazed. Remember last week we mentioned that uh, demon exorcism was a bit of a booming business here. There, there are great historical uh, writings regarding the Jews. This was quite a process. It often took hours and sometimes days with sort of mixed results. Jesus walks in, speaks a sentence, whoosh, and out the demon goes. That's why they're so amazed. Whoa, verse 36 then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. So I want to finish this up. We'll call this probably uh, Angels and Demons Part 2, uh, dot, 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 Louis Lucifer. Louis, Louis, boom, 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 boom. you got to go now. Boom, boom. Here we are. Let's review real quickly. You mind, Chris? Go ahead and put angels up first. Uh, for you note takers, this will be on our website. If you were with us last week, we spent a little more time. But, but quickly and in the form of review number one, all angels are created beings. And guess who created them? Jesus did. Uh, number two, they exist in other dimensions. And we had some fun with the understanding that heaven isn't way out there. Heaven likely, or more specifically, the multidimensional system where God dwells is not way far out there. It's likely all around us. Only we don't have the antenna to perceive it. Not yet. When we get our new bodies, it would seem, at the rapture, then we will. Number three, they're not former humans. Very important. Uh, with apologies to Miracle on 34th Street, Dan, or 30, 34th Street. 
Yeah, um, former humans, if you're really good, you'll get your wings. No, they're not former humans. Luke 16 tells us that, that if you know and love the Lord Jesus and you die, your spirit is immediately with Jesus himself. If you're not a born-again believer, then your spirit is immediately um, ushered to a place that the Bible describes as Sheol. And you have to wait there until you get your new body, and you will, but not at the rapture. It's a judgment day. And also in Luke 16, we find out, and here's the key point, if you're in this place, you cannot move from here to there. That's what's important. And coming up on this Halloween season, you know, ghosts and goblins. Oh, and by the way, do you know that over 67% of Americans um, believe wholeheartedly that they have had an encounter with a ghost? More than 67 um, when you were younger and spending the night over at your buddy's house, everybody put the flashlight under their chin, and then they begin to tell their stories. And, and you're saying, so that wasn't right, Pastor Seed? No, no, I believe you. You likely did see something supernatural, but it wasn't a ghost. It wasn't a former human. It was likely a demon masquerading as a former human. How do you know that? Because Luke chapter 16 says so. Number four, they can appear as humans. Number five, angels are a company and not a race. We all descend from Adam. Angels were individually and instantaneously created. Each individually created in its own sort of um, entity. Um, so that's a very, we're, if you, for lack of a better description, we're different species, if, if that helps. We're not the same. Number six, angels are not omniscient, as we see here today. What, what, what are you doing here, Jesus? Is it that time? They know their theology. They just don't know the timing. They're not omniscient. Only God is. Number seven, one-third of all the angels that were created fell. They rebelled at Lucifer's sales pitch. We saw that in Revelation chapter 12. So God didn't create demons. God created angels, but he gave them their own free will, just like he gives us humans. And Lucifer's sales pitch was so compelling, one third of them believed Lucifer <clears throat> more than God himself. Those fallen angels are what we battle here as demons. Number eight, angels are never to be worshipped. Uh, if an angel showed up here today, he would be quite he would be quite magnificent. And by the way, Lucifer himself as well. Um, from the Middle Ages and on, we like to depict Lucifer as a hideous looking creature. You know, he's got uh, hooves for feet, and he's got a little tail. And then he runs around in a red suit jabbing people with his pitchfork. He would love you to hold that quaint notion of him. He's not. We're going to see this morning. Angels, though, quite, here's the point. They're quite magnificent, but never to be worshipped. Revelation 22, we saw the angel. When John saw one, he falls down and worships. And the angel says, no, no, um, we're both servants. Only God is to be worshipped. Number nine, angels are extremely sensitive to rebellious hearts. We'll see more on that this morning. Then we moved on last week. Then we went to demons. Go ahead. Demons, number one, they're fallen angels. That's who they are. And remember, too, we know that angels have a different hierarchy. They're, every angel was evidently designed for a series or a purpose of some kind. And so some demons are strong, pardon me, some angels are stronger <clears throat> than others. So when the third of them fell, I suppose we would assume take a cross section of the hierarchy of angels. And then demons, it would seem, have a similar hierarchy. There are some demons that are very difficult and some demons even more difficult than those. Remember when Jesus came off of the Mount of Transfiguration and there was a, a demon-possessed boy and the disciples couldn't cast him out. Jesus says, oh, I know this one. This one only comes out with 
fasting and prayer. And we saw last week also that Ephesians chapter 6 talks about or lists the different sort of um, hierarchies of demons. Some demons are in charge of entire nations or cultures, and then on down to demons that are in charge of individual people. So number one, demons are fallen angels with different powers and abilities. Number two, like angels, demons can function in this dimension. We told the story of 1 Kings chapter 22. Number three, demons have access to heaven. That's an important understanding because there are those who think that, you know, if we're having a Holy Spirit revival and um, we are worshiping in spirit and in truth, it becomes a holy place, and it does. But there are those who have a mistaken notion. All right, so when we are sort of one with the spirit, the Holy Spirit, then it's sort of a picket fence gets put up around the place and demons can't come in. What's the real answer? Oh, they can come in and out. By the way, Job chapter 1, Lucifer himself is in the presence of God. There's a notion that Lucifer lives in hell. No, that's a Greek mythology. Lucifer probably spends most of his time, the book of, a, the book of Revelation also tells us where. He's in the throne room. And you know what he's doing there? He's tattling on you. They have access to heaven until the midpoint of the great tribulation. Then they're, then they're cast out. Number four, they have an organized hierarchy. We saw this last week. A, principalities, which are kingdoms. We saw that in Daniel 10. Powers, these are demons in charge of individual people. We saw the woman bent over for 18 years in Luke chapter 13. There's rulers of this age. These are demons in charge of the culture. They're the ones that are planning the Super Bowl halftime. They're the ones who sort of set up the culture that we all struggle with. That's what they do. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't be conformed to this world. Why not? Because it was designed to appeal to your fallen senses. And then D, wickedness in heavenly places. That's your more specific occultism. And if you've noticed, it's growing and growing here in America. Psychic fairs and... Ouija boards, and, and I hope you don't consult your, your uh, astrology every day. God made the stars, and what, are their, what is their design? They are to declare the glory of God. We've got teachings on that. If you know the names of the stars within the constellations that the sun travels through each month, it is the gospel story. It really is. It's called the Meseroth. But Lucifer is saying, well, we can't have that. We can't have that sort of cheap advertising. You know what I'll do? I'll pollute it. So he gets into astrology, and therefore the humans think that it occurred to them. Ding! Hey, if we can map the macrocosm with such precision, it would follow then we could map the microcosm with equal precision predicting future events. That's the stuff that Deuteronomy 18 says, stay away from. If nobody has ever told you before, stay away from astrology. And every Pisces in the room went, no, I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, demons have a certain end that we'll see that today. Number six, demons seek a human home. That's where they'd like to live. They'd like to hang out with you and your family. And very likely there are demons that probably have been following your family. Um, Dr. Phil notices it. He's no theologian, of course. But he says, you know, if you come out of a dysfunctional family and if you don't really learn about what that dysfunction is, what is entailed in that dysfunction and and, and how to build appropriate boundaries and how to, to communicate and, then, and meet your, your needs, etc. Well, then you're likely going to spin out of that one dysfunctional family and form another. And many of us in the room are, are in various places of that process. 
How many of you came from a very dysfunctional family, but because you love the Lord, you're not in a dysfunctional family now? <laughs> Liars, because they're all dysfunction. <laughs> Trick question, Mike. <laughs> I'm sort of playing with you. Um, Dr. Phil notices it. I think there is a spiritual component just as real. I believe that the demons that are in charge of humans, likely when your one human sort of lives their lifespan, um, why not hang with the family? And they're the ones that put the fun in dysfunctional. Anyway, demons seek a human home. And seven, the Bible forbids interaction with occultism. Anybody trying to tell you the future or anyone trying to say, are you kind of confused, you know? Let me read your palm. Let me look at the tea leaves or the chicken bones or look into the crystal ball or give me a lock of your hair and I will discern what's really going on. Super natural knowledge. God says, find it with my Bible, okay? Why? Because demons, what is their end game? They know that their future is absolutely sealed and certain. It would appear that they have an opinion about that. They really hate God and they realize, because remember their perspective is different from ours. We don't really see into that multi-dimensional system where God lives, but they do. And they know what they have lost. I've had the occasion of, of, of praying with and praying for and delivering two different people from literal demonic possession. You mean that stuff is real? Oh, yes. It is. And every time, I should say both times, and I'm, I'm aware of two others, personal friends of mine and some of their, how they described it. And, and every time, why does the demon hang on so tenaciously to their human host? Because it's just a little bit of whatever, because they know that coming soon, they will be forever separated from anything that is beauty, anything that is life and truth, belonging, future, purpose love and joy and peace. Not much more time until they know that's all that they will have forever and ever. And demons agonize over what they've lost. And they hate God. Kind of like Cain. Why do you hate God? Because like Cain, God says, Cain, did you kill your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Cain, if you don't stop this road, if you don't get off this train, sin is waiting at the door and it seeks to have you. It seeks to seize you. And he continues on, murders his brother. And God says, I'm going to have to put a mark on you so people will watch out. Fine, says Cain. I'm out of here. The way that it's worded is, you're running me out of here. But as a careful examination of the scriptures, God did not tell him, get out of Dodge. That was Cain's idea. Look what you have done to me, says Cain. Seriously? I'm going to be a wanderer forever. Look what you did to me. Whoa, whoa, God didn't do any of that. He gave Cain every opportunity to get off the train of sin. And when he didn't, and difficult things kept encroaching on his life, finally the murder of his brother and the, and the, the rage of his brother's avengers and everybody after him, or at least some people after him, look at this pickle, Lord, that you have put me in. Seriously, whose responsibility is that? It's Cain's. He leaves, I'm out of here. And he founds this little city called Nob, which means to wander. And if you do the, the, the genealogy of everybody who descended from Cain, oh, it's awful. By the way, Dan, that's where uh, professional musicians come from. They come from that one. <laughs> Among other terrible things. Well, see, that's a microcosm of what the demons are. They hate God. And they're firmly convinced that he done me wrong. They hate God with such 
passion, such a, such a vitriol. Well, they can't really get at him. So you know what they go after? They go after what God loves with such passion. You. His kids. What's their end game? They know what their future is. Their hope they can take as many of you with them as possible. Really? All right, so are you ready for our study this morning? Let's go to our next one. Uh, Lucifer, that's his name. Devil and Satan and Mr. Big Mouth and all that, you know. Uh, those are all sort of descriptions, but his name is Lucifer. Let's start with an understanding, shall we? Join me in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 28. Many of you, this will be review, but uh, for some, perhaps you might not have seen this before. Ezekiel chapter 28, please. Let's start at verse number, uh, verse number 12. Ezekiel, we have studied, we've covered this book in our Wednesday night study, and this is a God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel about some of the, the nations that were surrounding Israel at the time, and, and one of them was this... Uh, this group of uh, terrorists called, uh, they, were the, they lived in a city called Tyre. And boy, were they awful to God's people. And so God says, I got a judgment for you. And you, king of Tyre, you know, here's what's going to happen to you. But now notice the shift in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, because he's been speaking about him in the first portion of this chapter. Now speak to him again. And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. You mean the king of Tyre was a really handsome guy? Now what's going to happen? We're going to see here in a minute. You were in the Garden of Eden. Wait a minute. The human who was the king of Tyre, he wasn't that old. The Lord is speaking to the demonic force behind the human, the king of Tyre. This is now speaking of Lucifer. Now notice one of the first physical descriptions. You were the seal. That's the Hebrew word that we're going to get our word, blueprint. You were the blueprint on how to look really awesome. Perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. It, it might be that as beautiful as God can make anything he desires, potentially the most beautiful entity, sentient being that God ever created was Lucifer. You were in Eden the garden of God. Now we know that he's not talking about the human. He's talking about Lucifer, the power behind the king of Tyre. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. And then it names them. You mean he walked and he jangled with clanking gems? Maybe. But I think this is the Lord trying to communicate Lucifer is clothed, not in uh, poly-knit fabrics. Um, he is clothed, it would seem, in every color of the spectrum. Well, in fact, his name, Lucifer, we're going to get our word lucent from. And what does lucent mean? Light. And it names what he's wearing. And then look here toward the end of verse 13. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Timbrels were a percussive instrument that you strike it and it either vibrates a string or a membrane or a drum. Uh, it could be anything from cymbals to chimes to any number of things. So instruments that connote to some degree rhythm. I might be reading too much in, but it strikes me when you strike an instrument to make it sound, and a good orchestra has plenty of those, and pipes. Pipes are a wind instrument. Um, you think of Pan, the Greek god. I, I can't, that's terrible, but you know what I'm talking about. And then organs, as you know, and various instruments that you blow through. Um, those instruments are about melody and harmony. 
I believe, I hope I'm not reading too much into it, timbrels, which are percussive, which are about rhythm, and then pipes, which are melodies and harmonies. That's why your wind chimes sound so beautiful, because hopefully each pipe is tuned to a different frequency when it is struck. And the pipes, if you blow wind across something and it sounds an instrumental tone, this is all of music. He was born, or if that's the right term, created with music flowing in and around and through him. Some have said, well, yeah, because he's the worship leader in heaven. You know, maybe, I don't know, but he definitely is made for and by music. Music is powerful, I don't have to tell you that. And all music was originally designed in God's creation to lift the emotion. To music, if done beautifully, does something for us. You know what I'm talking about. Music um, lifts the heart. Sometimes music consoles the broken heart. If you're in a bad mood, what do you do? You don't play James Taylor. <laughs> I'm so dating myself. James Taylor. Who's James Taylor? Don't, don't play James Taylor when you're feeling bad. What do you do? You play Journey. No, I don't anymore, Dan, but I used to. <laughs> oh, my brain, my poor, poor, wicked brain. Praise God that, of course, I don't listen to those folks anymore because uh, I love God's music. God invented all music to be quite powerful indeed. And the devil knows it. What does the devil know so much about music? He was built with music. He knows what it is. And that's why he worked so hard to pervert and convert God's wonderful agency to move the soul of man. Only he turns it to ACDC or, again, I'm, I'm dating myself. Does that make sense? When, when your pastor says, Harvest, be careful about what you listen to. Oh, Pastor Steve, you're just being an old fuddy-duddy. Well, I know how music affects me. So as a rule, I don't listen to anything that's not Christian. And anymore, I have to now put a little asterisk on. Be careful, Harvest, what you're listening to on your Christian stations. Well-meaning Lyricists are knitting together phrases that are nice, but they're not biblical. Be careful even then as well. Anyway, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Um, I can only find four cherubim mentioned specifically. Um, it's fascinating that there are cherubim when God tells Moses to uh, construct the tabernacle. He says, this is a working model of what actually takes place in heaven. Oh, is it? Yeah. And on the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, there was embroidered on the veil, do you remember what it was? Some cherubim. And then you get to the ark itself, and it was a box overlaid with wood, but then the lid on top was called the mercy seat. It was solid gold. And do you remember how it was fashioned? Now make sure you fashion two angels with their wings outstretched in front of them, overlapping, and it will form a shadow on the top of the mercy seat. That's the shadow. This mercy seat is where I will manifest my presence. Well, I thought no one has seen the Father at any time and lived. That's correct. So how Moses beheld the presence of the Lord was not the actual personage, but it was the form of God's glory, <clears throat> the Shekinah glory. Most people know that, that God illuminated the camp of Israel during Moses' sojourn through the desert, he lit the, the, um, the, tent, the camp at night with a pillar of fire. And in the daytime, it was a cloud of smoke. And it wasn't just a column. It moved in the form of a column. And then, says the Bible, it spread out and formed a bit of an umbrella, a parasol. After all, you need a break in that searing sun. 
And following the Lord in those days, as, as John Corson says, wasn't hard. Just stay cool, man. Just stay under the shadow. It was really easy to know how to follow God. When your shadow moved, it's, it's really hot. Go get back under the shadow. Get back under the authority. Get back under the covering of God. No man has seen the Father at any time, but if you're a careful student, you've noticed in the book of Exodus and in various other places where a human encountered God. Wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say that no one's encountered the Father and lived? Yes. Well, did they encounter God? Yes. Who was it, everyone? It was Jesus. You're killing me, Steve. What? When Jesus resurrected with his new eternal body, remember, his is the first prototype. We'll get one similar at the rapture. We're not Jesus, but our physical bodies will have some similarities to Jesus' new body. One of the cool things that will happen is we'll all be able to sit in God's presence. That's really cool. This new body is made of some kind of material. I'll tell you what. Moses, God, I want to see you. The Father, I want to see you. God can't, Mo. If you were to see my face, it's too much for you. It's like putting your mouth on a fire hose. You, you can't handle it. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hide you in the cleft of the... Oh, who's the rock, everybody? I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by. You'll just see my afterglow, my, my glory, my Shekinah. And even on Sunday mornings and more and more on Wednesday nights... Man, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling just the fullness, the glory of God, and it is glorious. It's like, I don't want to, it's like we don't want to do anything else. That's just, that's a taste, that's a sliver. Imagine when your new physiological ears are tuned, and your eyes can see, and you're, you can see and perceive all of the fullness of what heaven is like, and of course, him who sits on the throne. Imagine. Well, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to take that all in with your new body. But until then, you're going to have to wait. Back to our study. This is amazing to me. Let's keep, keep cruising about Lucifer. Again, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes and your pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. The Ark of the Covenant featured two angels on top, cherubim, Evidently, there were two angels that are the closest to the presence of the Lord. You can see some of the other cherubim in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 10 and some other places. And in the book of Revelation, you can see them. But it would appear that if the tabernacle is a model of what's actually in heaven, there are two, evidently, cherubim who cover I don't know exactly what that means. I know that it's important. My hunch is the two highest ranking angels were Michael the archangel, and if the two featured on the mercy seat or any indication, who might have been the other? Just speculation, but I wonder. Right here he is called one of the cherubim who covers. Is that a hint? I don't know, but it's a fascinating postulation. I establish you, you are on the holy mountain of God. In heaven, there's a mountain of sorts, and God sits at the summit. You walk back and forth amidst the fiery stones, a reference to angels. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, this is an idea of merchandising or salesmanship, you had a silver tongue. You became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane thing out of the mountain of God. You have to mark your margin. Future hasn't happened yet, but it will, and it is absolutely certain. Just now, Lucifer still has access. You might say he got his condo evicted, but he still can get to the presence of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. 
Verse 17, your heart is lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. It's very important if you have blessings of any kind in your life, by all means, please enjoy them to the fullest. But never mistake God's blessings for his either permission or sneaking in. Look at the cool things you have earned. Look where it got Lucifer. Every blessing, every perfection, every beauty, every remark, man, you're a good-looking angel. (laughs) Instead of reflecting all of that response to God who created him, he started believing some of his own press. Oh, if we have anything beautiful, anything of value, please remember, don't hold it too tightly. It's not yours. Amen, Harvest? I cast you to the ground. You might mark in your bar- margin Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. I laid you before kings. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. That they may gaze at you. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities and by iniquity of your trading, your merchandising, your salesmanship. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. Now go to the left to the book of Isaiah, more to the story. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, more to the story. Here in this section of Isaiah, the prophet is talking about the Antichrist and Babylon. And again, there's a human involved to be sure, but now we're going to see the same sort of thing. God is going to talk to the real supernatural power behind the human. Are you in Isaiah chapter 14? Look at verse number 12. Verse number 12, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. All right. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. There's his name. Lucifer means shining one or, comma, son of the morning, morning star. That's his name, Lucifer. Satan is a description. The devil is a moniker. His name is Lucifer. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, cut down to the ground or to the earth, that doesn't happen yet until the midpoint of the great tribulation. You who weaken the nations, verse 13, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. You know, there's a lot of beings that can say that. Most angels have access to heaven. So that's something he could do, okay? As an aside, By the way, that's a privilege, not a right. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Uh, This is a a reference to angels, and I've got Bible verses. But um, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He could do that. It's potentially true that he was the highest ranking angel in all of God's creation, as we mentioned before, above all the stars of God. He could do that too. I will sit on the throne on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. This is a physical description of what is in heaven. There's a summit of some kind. I don't know how. don't know how it works. But um, he says, I'm going to ascend to the top of the mountain. And if he is one of the anointed cherubs who covers, he could do that. So these first three I wills are within his ability Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. You mean like the cumulonimbus clouds? Maybe, but I think this is the Shekinah glory, that cloud. Wow, you mean he could do that too? Comma, and now the fifth. I will be like the Most High. And that's when the buzzer in heaven went, "Eh, ooh, wrong answer, Lucifer. It seems that he could do these first four And then because of what he was able to do, then he went just a little further and demanded what he will do. 
We have an ability to do a number of things, and we're pretty sure we have control. That's one of the reasons why God says, stay away from sin. I have an ability to go into the liquor store. Yes, you do. I have an ability to watch all kinds of weirdness on my computer. Yes, you do. I have an ability to stroll into whatever and, and with doctor's prescription take a number of mind-altering types of pharmacia. Yes, you do. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. Be careful with the beautiful freedoms that God has given you. Enjoy them but don't ever let it go to your head like it did Lucifer. I'm able to do this, and I'm able to do that, and I'm able to do this. Hmm, must be I'm God. Do you see where it can lead? I'm in control, not you. Be careful, be, be grateful for the many blessings God has given you, but be careful with your abilities not to fall into Lucifer coaxing you just a little further. You are in control of your own life. <laughs> the captain of your soul. Arr. Verse 15. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. We're going to read about that in a minute. Right, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. The lowest depth of the pit, that's the abuso. And you write in your margin there, 4,000 years. Lucifer is going to be bound for 1,000 years of the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 16, those who see you will gaze at you. That's a fascinating Hebrew word, bene. It means to discern with a deep understanding, with a narrow eye. You know what the narrow eye is? It's, it's like when Jaden ever introduces me to one of her, well, she doesn't have many. If she ever brought a boyfriend by, I would, as her father, look at them narrowly. Who are you? I would take a great interest. I would have a, I would have a desire to be a very understanding. They're going to see you. They will gaze upon you. They will look upon you narrowly. And they will consider you saying, this? Now, I want you to see this harvest. If you have a highlighter, please highlight this. You need to know this is in your Bible. We are going to look upon the actual personage of Lucifer himself one day. Now, because we are greatly handicapped, our senses only go so far, the spiritual realm has probably some advantages over the typical human. They just know stuff. Demons have been around ever since humans have been around. They know all about Dr. Phil's stuff. They know all about that stuff. They're very, they've accumulated a great wealth of knowledge. They're brilliant in the sense that they have tremendous experiential prowess. We only get 70, 80 years on this planet, you know, kind of. We are at a bit of a disadvantage, and so, therefore, Lucifer or the devil, those things are kind of scary. One day, look at this. Those who see you will gaze upon you. They will look narrowly upon you, and they were considering this, saying, You? You did all this? One day, we're going to have new bodies. One day, we're going to have no ability to conceptualize sin. That's kind of like Adam and Eve before they ate of the fruit. We're not going to fear anything because perfect love casts out fear. We're going to have all the advantage and all the perspectives of living in that multidimensional system, our own clothing, garments of light pulsating with the frequency of heaven. And with all that now and all of our sinful deeds gone, every terrible thought erased from our brain, we're going to look at Lucifer one day and we're going to go, you? Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook the kingdoms of the world? Who made the world as a wilderness, destroyed its cities, wouldn't let people out of prisons? You've heard the term, 
is if God is such a God of love, why is there cancer? Why are there crack babies? Why is there gang wars? Why is there genocide? This is why he did that. You destroyed the cities. You did not open the house of the prisoners. Uh, we don't have time. You can kind of cruise on that if you like at your leisure and keep cruising. But now that we know who he is, let's go back to, actually, we're kind of done with Luke. Let's just uh, fill in our, 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 uh, our, our card here. Um, Lucifer, number one, now that we know a little bit about him, number one, Lucifer is to be respected, but not feared. Um, get your spiritual track shoes on. I want to show you some verses. Let's go to the book of Jude. Jude is right in front of the book of Revelation. Go to Jude. It's one chapter long. I want to I show you these things. I could read the verses, but I want you to have them sort of in your, in your notes and in your mind where it is on the page. In Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter, there, Jude is talking about the heresies that were happening in and amongst the first and early church. And among them were false teachers. And one of the things that they were teaching was, you know, you can order demons around. Jude goes, no, verse 8, Jude. Likewise, also these dreamers, these are the false teachers of false prophets, defile the flesh. They reject authority. And they speak evil of dignitaries. Interesting word. It's the Greek word doxa. D-O-X-A. Hey, I've heard of the doxology. If you're from a high church background, praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's the doxology. Doxa. And it means angelic majesties. Praise him all creatures here below. That's what it means. There are people that are ordering demons around. God's word says, oh, don't do that. They are not and never to be trifled with. Case in point, verse 9. Remember Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, or Lucifer, when he disputed about the body of Moses. When was that? Answer, I don't know. But Moses died. He was buried in Moab, says the Bible. And evidently, Lucifer wanted his body. Why? Likely because Moses is one of the, the two witnesses that are going to show up in the first part of the tribulation. But that's speculation. Well, they were dispart, disputing over the body of Moses. Dared not to bring against him a reviling accusation. Even Michael didn't trifle with Lucifer. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. That's plenty. That's all you need. And if you've been around the church, and some people talk about this, uh, um, maybe it's past lives. I don't know what they're trying to do with you, but there are some churches that like to boss demons around. Yet yeah, don't do that. You can rebuke demons and demon activity in the name of Jesus Christ. But you can't say, I command you, demon, go to, you know, go to, Go to Chick-fil-A, whatever it might be. You can't order demons around. Number two for our, for our teaching, he is the father of lies. You mean he's the father of every lie? Well, maybe, but I think more specifically, he was the first liar, and he, then he trains others to lie for him. And whenever I'm considering a lie, just remember how that whole lying thing got started. Number three, he does not live in hell. Revelation 12 verse 10 tells us that the accuser of the brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. This lets you know, where does Lucifer spend most of his time? I'm pretty sure at the intersection of South Virginia and Moana. <laughs> Take a deep breath, Steve. How many times have I almost wrecked my car there anyway? Or better yet, he lives near the spaghetti bowl. That's probably where he lives. No, he spends most of his time in heaven, you guys. Number four, he's the highest form of wisdom and beauty. We've looked at Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah. Now you know why. Number five, his greatest advantage over humans 
Is anyone with a non-biblical mind or emotions? This would include Christians. We are not living God's word. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says, Satan can take advantage. Number six, his only hold on a human is through sin. Romans 7 verse 20 Three, the law of sin and death. That's how Lucifer gets you to do his bidding, or more specifically, not Lucifer himself, but the demonic fallen angels that are on assignment over you for you to blow up your life. Well, how do they get you to do so? They get you believing you know better than God's word. Number seven, Christian has power over 1 John 4, verse 4, greater is he that is in you, Christians, than he that is in the world. Does that make sense? Um, Who made Lucifer? Jesus did. And if Jesus is living in your heart, then it's no match. Is it a pitched battle between the forces of good and evil in this Kona? You know, there's weighing in at 175 pounds. (laughs) The whirlwind from Nazareth. (laughs) No. And the other corner of Satan. No. It's not a pitched battle. There is no doubt who will win. Greater is he that's in you, Harvest, than he that is in the world. Number eight, he will be bound for a thousand years. Let's check this out. You're close. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Let's read it because it makes me feel better when I do. Chapter 20, look at verse number one. This is at the end of the great tribulation. All the seals and trumpets and bowls have been opened and exhausted. Jesus has come back, Revelation 19. And now he's saying, all right. Number one, verse, chapter 20, verse one. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a great key to the bottomless pit. That's the abuso. And a great chain laid in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. At the end of that millennial reign of Christ, Lucifer is let out one more time. Why would God do that? It would seem that even though no demonic activity throughout the thousand year reign, planet Earth is restored to Eden, new body believers, you and I have been interdispersed throughout a reconstituted paradise like Earth. And humans have been repopulating the planet. They're living for a thousand years. Anyone who dies at a hundred, we say, what a tragedy. It's beautiful. It's come full circle. Started in Eden, all the dispensations. Now we're back to Eden. At the end of a thousand years with Jesus living on the planet, Lucifer is let out. He sings his siren song, whatever that is. What is it? God is judgmental. I follow me and I will give you what you want. I don't know what it'll be. It's the same song that got the third of the angels. And you know what the Bible says? How many humans after living a thousand years on Garden of Eden type earth, you know how many humans fall in line? Most. Fascinating. Verse three, he cast him into the bottomless pit and he shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years are finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And then number nine, finally, what we'll say when we see him, it's Isaiah 14, verse 16. I get three verses and we'll end here. I believe that these are three of the most powerful Verses, please commit them to memory. Put them on a sticky, put them on either your Bible or your refrigerator, which one ever you open more. <laughs> I say that with some great conviction, by the way. These three, would you mind? Isaiah 14, verse 16, go ahead. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider, look narrowly upon. And they say, is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook the kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities and did not open the house of the prisoners? Him? You got to know that one harvest. Why? He is defeated. He is defeated. 
You gotta have that one in your arsenal. Next one, Ephesians 6, verse 12. Most of you have this committed to memory. For we do not wrestle against your spouse. Can I get an amen to that? We're not wrestling against that awful supervisor. We're not wrestling against COVID. We're not wrestling against the Democrats or the Republicans. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age. Now you know what those are. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. This is the correct perspective. When you're gathering your rebuttal to your spouse, you've drawn a breath and they jump in, you know, and you're not really listening to what they're saying. You're just building your rebuttal. Boy, do I have stuff to smoke their line of reasoning. Instead of that, remember this verse and maybe quote it. This battle, this tension between husband and wife. Wait a minute. It's not because I got a broken one. It's because of sin. The devil is trying to do something here. And then finally, James 4, verse 7. I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'm going to say it. Too much of the typical church, what people understand church to be, I believe, is, is a misnomer. Harvest, I don't know if you've ever considered this, but a church is not a social club. The church is not designed by the Lord so that you can build a lot of great friendships and go camping and build lifelong relationships. Now, that does happen in a church, but it's not the goal. Yeah, what I'm getting at is, where's your women's ministry at? Where's your men's ministry at? Where's your young adults? Where's your singles adults? Where's your this? Where's your that? Too many Christians, in my opinion, have been brought up with a misnomer. Church is not for us. It is for him. Amen. And so churches who wet the finger and try to discern the direction of the wind of culture and rush quickly to be what the people want. In fact, they even call it felt needs, seeker-friendly. So the name of the game is, you obviously can't talk about the real, you got to stop sinning verses, because the Bible says that a mind who does not have Jesus is hostile, hostile to his word. And if I'm packing them in with multiple services, that's not the mark of you're doing well in Christ. Can, I hope that doesn't break anybody's heart. Here's the real benchmark of success. Have old things passed away. Have all things become new. Does sin bother me? And when I want to get together at church, it's not so I'll feel good with all my buddies. In my humble opinion, the church knocks itself out trying to supply the people artificial spiritual life support systems. And in my opinion, COVID was one of the things that God did to take that option off the table. We've been saying it for years around here. If you're not able to get to 350 South Rock Boulevard or any programs we have, will you feed yourself in God's word? Will you still grow? That said, James 4 verse 7, and I promise I'll let you out of here. Therefore, submit to God. When you do that, you, without trying, resist the devil. Then he will flee from you. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Let me break that down. Therefore, submit to God. There's your 12-step program. There's the answer to your marital strife. There's the answer to everything that the enemy has thrown at you. You don't need a program. You have to submit. Which means, are you in your Bible very much? I don't know about you, but if I'm not word, worship, prayer, and fellowship every day, I'm that quick to follow my own lusts. 
And then I start looking narrowly at my spouse. Let's all stand. Lord Jesus, thank you for the patience of this listening audience. Thank you, Lord, that they're still wearing their masks. <laughs> rasa, frasa, rasa, frasa, stupid masks. What would you do if I told you that masks were allowed by God? It's a dipstick into your spiritual oil pan. What? When you put that mask on and it goes against every fiber of your U.S. constitutional spirit, but you do because the authorities that God has placed in your life has asked you to, you've resisted all the conspiracy theories flooding social media, and it really comes down as you look into that cotton little thing, I hate this thing. And you strap it behind your ears. It is a little dipstick, I believe, into the spiritual oil pan of every believer. Why do I have to do this? Because God says, do you trust me that I am at work? And when we chafe because we can't get our church program stuff together, we're not uh, this ministry and that ministry because of COVID, stupid COVID. What if it's a God thing? What if God is systematically disassembling the artificial life support systems in your life? Will you still grow in Christ? Will you word worship prayer and fellowship every day? Because God's word says quite emphatically, when you do that, you are submitting to God and then you do not have to lift a finger because you're filled with the spirit. You are resisting that devil and he will flee. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that that one huge spiritual principle comes alive in every heart. 12-step programs have their place. It is important that we do fellowship, but not in the form that we're familiar with. The real name of the game is maybe I don't need a bunch of marriage counseling. Maybe I need to stop and get my hands off the steering wheel. Search me, O oh God. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Then what will my spouse look like after that? In Jesus' name and all the teachable the Lord said, Amen. Amen. 